Hey there. Yesterday in the last video, Tony had read for you quite a long reading. <laughs> um, we are digging into the three degrees of mercy. And that's mercy in our deeds, in our words, and in our prayers. And so mercy indeed was page 143 all the way through 157. And he discussed a couple of questions for you so that you could dig a little deeper on that matter. And I've got a few more questions for you today. So today is going to be a light day compared to yesterday and um, more of a reflecting on what you've read and really kind of pulling some of that out for you to sit with it and see how the Lord speaks to you. So let's start with prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. My adorable Jesus, may our feet journey together. May our hands gather in unity. May our hearts beat in unison. May our souls be in harmony. May our thoughts be as one. May our ears listen to the silence together. May our glances profoundly penetrate each other. May our lips pray together to gain mercy from the Eternal Father. Amen. And, O Blessed Lady, spread the effect of grace to thy flame of love over all of humanity, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. So, if you remember, yesterday he had asked the question about have you felt Existential, um, ex or extreme is another big word. <laughs> Have you felt extreme loneliness, right? Um, of course we felt that. And so um, think about how you answered that question. And then the next one was, will you embrace the attitude of love? Right? Deep down, we're all thirsting for love. And usually the people that are going around hurting other people have been broken severely. They have been hurt and wounded traumatically that they don't know that really all they're seeking in life is love. That's that's what they're looking for, but they can't just stop, you know, long enough to be still and realize that that's what they need in their, in their lives. Here's another question for you to add to mercy indeed before we move on to word. Jesus asks us first to show mercy indeed. One way we can do this is to delight in others. How do we delight in others when they don't seem delightful? In the text, he gave a lot of advice for how we can develop the merciful outlook. In one place, Father Gately described the merciful outlook as an attitude that says, I delight that you exist. However, sometimes it's not so easy to delight in another person, and it can take a whole lot of work. It takes deep sea diving where we try to find the good in others right? It's, it's like digging deep to find that Jesus in there. I know he's in there somewhere. Dig deep. We got to find him. <laughs> it takes prayer in which we ask for the grace to love the other. It also takes imagination because we need to try to see where the other person is suffering. Oftentimes, we can develop a love for someone who is not easy to love, when we reflect on how they are suffering. Are we willing to do this, this type of work? If so, why not begin today? Think of the person in your life who is most difficult to love. Whew, you might not want to think about that person today. Today, you probably didn't want to think about that person at all. But God just put them on, the, on your heart, didn't he? <laughs> Maybe that's the person you need to pray for today. Now, now that that person's popped in your mind, let's do some deep sea diving and record the good things about them in your journal or wherever you're taking notes. 
Even it could be in the, the side part of your book. Write that person's name. You can write their initials. You know, just something that reminds you. And start writing good things about them. Now, let's pray for the grace to love that person. Finally, reflect on how that person may be suffering, even in a hidden way. Write down how he or she may be suffering. And so that really puts things into pers perspective, doesn't it? You know, when we, we stop focusing on the things they've done to us or the reasons why we don't like them, and we really start going, okay, I love them because of this and this and this. And and I pray for them because they suffer like this and this. It really helps change perspective. The next thing is, what is your favorite part about the Merciful Outlook? Beginning on the bottom of page 413, Father Gately summarizes the Merciful Outlook in 10, in ten mini descriptions. Read over these descriptions. Pick up the, your top three that speak to your heart. So I'm going to read those now if you haven't had a chance to read those. 413. And he gives... Okay, it bleeds over from page 413 and it bleeds over to page 414. So I'll read these for you real quick. The merciful outlook is truly merciful because it recognizes that mercy is a bilateral reality such that as we give, we also receive. Thus, it isn't the patronizing outlook. Evangelization proclaiming the good news of Christ's love through an authentic love for another. Thus, it's not a prosintha. I don't know. It's a very big word. I should have had Tony do today, too. <laughs> My apologies. But a response to existential loneliness that gives a cup of love to help quench our neighbor's thirst as well as our own. The gaze of God. It sees the good in others and brings it to light. It draws it out. Thus, it's not the judgmental outlook which focuses on and draws out evil. Wonderful. Because of the sense of awe and wonder, we feel at seeing the other as an unrepeatable manifestation of Christ's own beauty. Isn't that awesome? Doesn't, isn't that what you hope? when you leave a room or you've impacted someone's life, that that's how they remember you? I mean, wouldn't that be so beautiful? Unrepeatable manifestation of Christ's own beauty. A terribly loving gaze that says you are great because it sees the true greatness as well as the potential for greatness in the other. I, I see that a lot with teachers, right? Teachers can see the potential in that troublesome child that tends to give everybody a hard time, but there's such great potential for growth. And teachers have that gift. They can usually see such a, you are great. Deep sea diving. Knowing there is buried treasure in the other, a facet of the face of Christ not found in any other, and swimming through murky waters to find it. Something that takes courage and perseverance because it sometimes meets with misunderstanding, coldness, and rejection. Nobody likes to be rejected, you know? So I can understand, you know, if you've got a family member or a loved one that's just giving you a hard time and and you're trying and you're trying and you just get rejected and rejected after and after. Nobody wants to keep coming back for rejection. But just remember, it takes courage and perseverance. 
to truly delight in each and every person we meet because we see in each one the unique member of the body of Christ he is. Thus, it's not the over-spiritualized outlook. Loving others with the heart of Christ because each of us is a member of his body and thus shares the same heart with him. These are really beautiful. You can find these on page 14, um, 413, the very bottom of 413, and then it picks back up on the top of 414. So which of those kind of spoke to you the most? It says that you could pick your top three. I would just recommend you just pick one. Pick one for now. Um, you know, if, if you did have three speak to you, great. But, you know, since we're, we're doing this retreat a little bit different than what it was designed, just pick that one that really speaks to you about that one person, right? That one person um, that you needed to think about and think about how they may be suffering. You know, which passage really will help you see that person with merciful eyes. And that wraps up word um, mercy in deed. So let's now begin with mercy in word, okay? This starts at page 157. Just as there are infinite ways of doing deeds of mercy, so also there are infinite ways to speak a merciful word. Unfortunately, theologians haven't categorized these ways as they have deeds of mercy. Thus, We'll have to settle for a simple definition and a few examples. A merciful word is anything written or said with the intention of alleviating the suffering of another. For example, a word that aims to give hope to the despairing, tries to get the sad to laugh, attempts to help the fearful to trust in Jesus, or seeks to make the lonely feel less Feel less alone in a word of mercy. Here, I'd like to focus on one specific word of mercy. It's actually a question. I call it the merciful question. The merciful question goes with the merciful outlook. Recall that the merciful outlook responds to the suffering of another's existential loneliness by expressing delight in him. Well, the merciful question is simply a way of helping us to experience this delight in the other. It does so by inviting the other, by means of a question, to open up, reveal his treasure, and show who he is. I said earlier that prudence tightens the nozzle of our compassion so it'll be effective. This also applies to when we want to show compassion through the merciful question. In other words, we need to be prudent in asking the merciful question. It's not gushing buckets of questions, and it's not an interrogation. It's a simple question or two at the right time and place that invites the other to di disclose their treasure so we might delight in them or perhaps even feel sorrow with them. For instance, after a small talk and the usual cordialities, cordialities, cor the, you know, there's just like, hey, how you doing? That kind of stuff. <laughs> so like after small talk and the usual, hey, how you doings, that help establish trust with one another. And if our duties allow us to take the time, we can ask a question about the other's hopes, joys, fears, or sorrows, and then simply listen. If the other wants to share and has the time for it, great. If not, that's fine too. Simply having asked the merciful question is an act of mercy but be prepared just as a lot of people out there starve to be delighted in 
so there are perhaps just as many who long to be listened to. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because so many people long to be listened to, we can be sure that our merciful question will meet with responses. Sometimes the responses will be a gentle trickling stream. At other times, they'll be like a dam bursting and will get flooded. And if that happens, don't worry. As we advance in prudence, we'll learn how and when to lovingly bring things to a close if need be. Of course, if we're beginners, we just might frequently get flooded. <laughs> if that happens, don't worry. It gives us practice in learning how to swim through um, sometimes messy waters of love. And the next time, we'll be able to do better. Speaking of practice, it might be helpful if I relate something of my own experience of learning to ask the merciful question. For me, the best school of learning to ask the merciful question was in seminary. Um, when Father Gately was in seminary. Several factors made it a particularly good school. There were many seminarians. We had to meet for conversation frequently, at least three times a day during meal times, and we were often different of ages, different temperaments and backgrounds. In such an environment, there were lots of opportunities to ask merciful questions, but that's not to say it was easy. It didn't take long for me to discover that the merciful question often needs to take different forms depending on the person to whom it's addressed. With some of the guys in the seminary, I learned it's best not to prod. Showing mercy to them usually meant keeping things light. For example, by talking sports or weather or by drinking or doing a lot of joking, you know, like joking around laughter right i mean imagine in seminary they are heavily inundated with studies and reading and and so i think keeping it light it makes sense in a in a seminary setting that makes total of sense to just do a lot of joking around interestingly enough after spending some time on the superficial they also appreciated a merciful question now and then as long as an injection of humor quickly followed their sharing. Other guys were starving for deeper conversation. They were the ones who felt most consoled by any question that asked about their joys and sorrows, hopes and fears. They were also the ones who gave me the most practice in learning to lovingly manage the floodwaters, right? <laughs> Then there were the intellectuals who were eager to delve into questions of philosophy or the mysteries of faith. With them, the merciful question was easy. I'd simply ask, so what'd you learn in class today? Then it would begin. Once we got into it and I asked my opinion, I have to confess that I was usually the one responsible for doing the flooding. <laughs> especially on the topic of divine mercy or Ignatius spirituality, which brings him to the last point about this merciful question. We ourselves should be open to answering the merciful question, um, uh, the merciful questions others pose to us. So you not only want to be prepared to ask a merciful question, but you may want to also prepare yourself and practice your answering <laughs> to a merciful question if someone asks you and kind of poses up to ask you a question. Once again, as Pope John Paul the Great, he wrote, Mercy is a bilateral reality. Thus, while the one who shares receives the gift of being listened to, there's also a gift for the person who gets to listen, who gets to see the treasure of the other open up. We all have inner riches, 
and we shouldn't be afraid to share them with others. However, we might want to make sure that the other really is open. Maybe their question was just small talk, and we might want to strive not to flood them. If we're not sure how to open the other is, like how open is that person, right? This is what he's talking about. Um, how open are they for dialogue with you in this conversation? Or are they still superficial? Are they still having small talk, talking about sports? Or are they re ready to dig in a little deeper? Before we begin, doesn't hurt someone. Da, da, da. I lost my place. Excuse me. If we're not sure how open the other person is before we begin, it doesn't hurt to ask something like, well, how much time do you have? If we end up flooding them anyway, at least we're giving them an opportunity to learn to swim and we can make a mental note to do better next time. So the merciful question, mercy seeks to know the other person, right? What is that other person's sufferings? What are their desires? What are, you know, maybe they're going through things that you don't even know they're going through. And this merciful question helps you just see a deeper level of this person. So mercy seeks to know the other person. It seeks out the understanding and being with the other. Do you ask people the merciful question in a way that shows your real interest in them? In conversation with others, do you do all the talking? Do you bother to ask people questions or are you just an answerer? Are you a good listener? Are you sincerely interested in what people are sharing? Reflect on these things and write how you might improve in asking the merciful question and being a good listener. Are you ready to share with others? There are people who are experts at avoiding talking about themselves. You know who you are. <laughs> Stop hiding in the shadows. You know. They are the first to ask us questions about how we are doing. But they always change the subject when it comes to themselves. Are you one of them? Hmm? Don't forget that mercy is a bilateral reality. You have a gift to offer to others. And you should also be ready to share with others. If you are one of those expert avoiders, ask yourself why you have a hard time sharing. Perhaps you've been hurt in the past or have a difficult time trusting people. What is the root? What's the root reason that you avoid having authentic conversations with someone? Write it down. Give it to the Lord. And he will help you. You might find great healing in just surrendering that one hurt to the Lord. So those are the two questions for mercy in word. And the next video tomorrow we'll talk about prayer, the prayers of mercy. But I would say, you know, even a merciful question is it's basically helping you understand where that person is in that moment. You know, if you were to ask me what our summer plans were, um, you know, last October, I would have probably answered a completely different vision of our summer as a family and the things that we were going to do this summer than what you see right now. <laughs> so life happens and it happens to all of us. That person could be hurting. They could be suffering. And you just simply asking a merciful question about their joys, about their sorrows, about their hopes, about their fears. 
could blossom into a beautiful relationship if you are just brave enough and courageous and perseverant in building that relationship. So let's close with this little prayer I found. It was just shoved in my book, so why not? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Above all, trust in the slow work of God. We are quite naturally impatient in everything to reach the end without delay. We should like to skip the intermediate stages. We are impatient of being on the way to something unknown, something new. And yet, it is the law of all progress that is made by passing through some stages of instability and that it may take a very long time. And so I think it is with you. Your ideas mature gradually. Let them grow. Let them shape themselves without undue haste. Don't try to force them on. As though you could be today what time, that is to say grace and circumstances acting on your goodwill, will make of you tomorrow. Only God could say what this new spirit gradually forming within you will be. Give our Lord the benefit of believing that his hands are leading you and accept the anxiety of feeling yourself in suspense and incomplete. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Be blessed, my friend. And we will pick back up on page 159 tomorrow.